You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. So I don't think the fact that this breach was censored in and of itself was probably particularly surprising. It would perhaps have been more surprising if it wasn't censored. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben discusses a groundbreaking Wisconsin court case relating to files stored in Dropbox. I revisit the legality of AI-generated code. And later in the show, Andrew Hollister from Logarithm discusses the Shanghai National Police data exposure incident and whether or not we may never know or ever know the full details of one of the largest data breaches in world history. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben, uh, let's jump in. We got some good stories for the new year. Why don't you start things off for us here? So my story I originally discovered through Professor Oren Kerr, uh, imaginary <laughs> friend of this podcast, right, right. Um, who linked me to the case. And of course, uh, you came in with it as your story, and, and we had to switch things around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it really is a, a groundbreaking case from the state of Wisconsin. Hmm. And it relates to files stored in a Dropbox account in the cloud. Mm-hmm. So I'll give a kind of a brief summary of what happened in the case, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about the interesting legal findings here. Hmm. Basically, there was this guy who worked for Taylor County in Wisconsin. He was a deputy sergeant uh, for their police department. Mm -hmm. And television producers for a show I've never heard of called Cold Justice were working with the county on producing some type of documentary or um, real crime drama uh, based in Taylor County. Okay. Uh, And they uh, agreed the... uh, County government agreed to give the show files related to a single murder, um, but this deputy sergeant took it upon himself to send files without county authorization uh, on a couple of unrelated murders, hmm. um, which violates uh, both the IT policy uh, for for the county and for law enforcement, uh, and potentially is is a uh, public corruption charge. I mean, hmm. you can be charged with abusing your office in revealing files that are essentially private. Okay. Uh, So he had saved files in Dropbox. It was a Dropbox account uh, that was started with his work email. So that's what's sort of interesting about this Hmm. case. He used his work email address to open up this Dropbox account. Once he opened it, he was the only one who had the password. I think they said he shared it with his girlfriend. Okay. uh, Maybe one or two other people. uh, Hmm. But he had not shared it with the county. Uh, he was the only person who, who uh, regularly checked in on the account. This was a mixture of his personal files and some of his work files. The only complicating factor, of course, uh, is that it was st- uh, started with a county email address. So hmm. there was a suspicion that uh, this guy, his name was Bowers, there was a su- suspicion that he was the one who leaked this material in an unauthorized manner to these television producers And as part of the investigation, uh, somebody in the county IT department did a password reset on uh, Bowers' Dropbox account. So, uh, you know, you don't have the password for it directly, but you know he started it with his work email. So you say, hey, I forgot my password. They send you the password reset. Sure enough, uh, he was keeping those files in there. Uh, They continued the investigation. It turned out he had emailed uh, the files and he was charged. Hmm. 
So he is seeking to suppress this evidence because he says that he has a reasonable expectation of privacy in information uh, that he has stored in that personal private Dropbox account. Mm. What the county is saying is that uh, this is a violation of 2007 and 2012 IT policies, which basically state that anything that's on a county device or done on a county network um, is you should not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in anything saved on, on a device or a network. Yeah, and that's pretty standard, I would say, for most workplaces, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, what the court is, is saying here, and I think this is unquestionably the correct decision in my view, is that this was not county property. This was not on a county network. Uh, this was not on a county device, although we know for, with Dropbox, you can certainly... Uh, access it on any device, but it right. wasn't specifically on a device. Really, this is the equivalent to somebody's container, a locked container full of papers and effects. Mm. And if this was a actual physical locked container with somebody's papers and effects, that would clearly require a, uh, a warrant under the Fourth Amendment, probable cause and a warrant. Uh, and that's what the equivalent is here. Mm. So we now have precedent from this one state that in these particular circumstances where you're saving something in the cloud and you've exhibited that subjective expectation of privacy by having a password protected, not sharing it with anyone, then you have that expectation of privacy and the government is going to need a warrant to obtain it. So they are going to suppress this evidence. Hmm. Um, one interesting element about this case that Orrin Kerr pointed out is even though this would seem somewhat obvious – there really hasn't been a lot of case law relating to this. Uh, basically, the assumption has been among these uh, cloud computing services that if they got this type of request, it better come with a warrant because otherwise they're not just willy-nilly going to hand over mm. somebody's private data that's stored in their account. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be not only bad PR, but it would just uh, subject them potentially to, to uh, breach of contract, lawsuits, mm. et cetera. Uh, so it's just unlikely you would ever get a case because it would also, if you were seeking to obtain a warrant, that's going to uh, lead to kind of a timeliness issue. Mm. Uh, usually you're trying to get access to information before somebody tries to destroy it or quote, un end quote, misplace it. <laughs> uh, so going through the whole warrant process can be cumbersome. So it's just, un it was unlikely that we were going to get a clear cut case of something like this. Uh, huh. And we did. And now, even though this is, technically only valid in, in the state of Wisconsin. I think this is something that we'll largely see uh, adopted nationwide. So let me ask you this. Let, let's bring it to the real world here. Let's say uh, you and I are sitting here in our CyberWire studios, and uh, I bring in a safe that I have purchased with my own money, and inside the safe there are some papers. Does my employer have the right to go through that safe without to to pick the lock on that safe without my permission or without a warrant. No, they do not. I think that's something that's echoed in this case. It's not about whether it physically takes place on county property. Uh -huh. And certainly uh Mr. Bowers probably accessed the uh these Dropbox files on a county computer. It's about that expectation of privacy. And there are ways you can evaluate whether somebody has that expectation of privacy and whether that expectation is reasonable. Mm. If you brought a safe in here and you were the only one who knew the password, that's pretty darn good evidence that you had a subjective expectation of privacy. Now, the fact that you brought it into the office is somewhat questionable. I would have recommended you just keep it at home. <laughs> right. Uh, so my judgment may be off. But. Right. Uh, but from a legal perspective, you have locked that that uh, that safe. Mm -hmm. You are the only one who has the combination to open it. Nobody else has access to it. There's no employer policy that says CyberWire has the right to access Dave Bittner's I see. Uh, okay. devices on our property. So there's just no evidence that you wouldn't have an expectation of privacy. But, but let's contrast that with my business email account, for example, where... Uh, I'm the only person who has the password for that. Uh, in fact, you know, it has multi-factor authentication, so I have both the password and the the, the uh, hardware key. Um, is this a case where company policy has clearly been spelled out that IT has the right to reset that account and access whatever's in it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where the expectation of privacy analysis begins, is there's yeah. a reason your employer... Uh, has that written out in a policy, even though you're not going to read it, 
it does tell you, <laughs> well, you might, but most people wouldn't read it. No, no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> uh, it tells you, I mean, usually explicitly, you don't have an expectation of privacy in anything you do on this email account because right. ultimately it was, it is within our dominion as an organization. Mm -hmm. It is, it is not yours. Um, I think most people kind of understand that instinctively, but that's why companies make that clear. There was no such explicit agreement relating to Dropbox. Um, you know, the only question in the case was whether this was kind of an extension of his email account. Right. Uh, because he was using his work email address. Right. And what the court said is that it's not. Um, just because mm. you use your work email address, that doesn't lessen your expectation of privacy, given that nothing in the... Uh, you know, IT policy that you signed governs something like cloud storage on a uh, with a with a personal uh, password, personal right, key. Right, right. And I could see. I'm just trying to puzzle through this. I mean, suppose I used my work email address to access my online medical records. Uh, I wouldn't expect that my employer would would be able to claim rights to view my medical records simply because I used my work email address as the to access that. I think that's a great example. I mean, that is not going to be, that's that's a relevant factor, whether you use your work email address. And mm -hmm. certainly if I were setting up a Dropbox to illicitly send files to TV producers, I'd probably go ahead and use my Gmail. Right. Um, but uh, that's not ultimately the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. uh, it really comes down to an analysis of that subjective expectation of privacy and whether that expectation is reasonable. And you kind of have to look at the totality of the circumstances. When we're talking about something like health records, you know, that's protected by HIPAA. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't contract that out in an IT policy and just say, <laughs> for the purpose of uh, our devices and our networks, uh, we supersede federal law related to protected health records. Right. I mean, that's that's something that's not going to hold up in court. Mm. So you would have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that even if you used your uh, work email account. I think the only thing that an IT department can do with its policies uh, is claim dominion ownership access to an email account and all of its contents or uh, anything that happens on anything that takes place on a device solely controlled by the organization. Mm -hmm. So if he had only accessed this Dropbox account using uh, the county's laptops or county mobile devices, perhaps that would have been a different story. He would have had a lessened expectation of privacy. Um, there is no evidence in this case that he did that. Um, so he was really seeking to conceal the contents of those files. Could the police force be in some kind of legal peril for accessing his Dropbox account without permission? Are, are they running afoul of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act by doing this? Uh, they probably uh, are fine for a couple of reasons. There's qualified immunity is, is one of them. <laughs> of course, um, of course. <laughs> the other is, is uh, a good faith exception uh, okay. under the Fourth Amendment. Basically, like, if case law is unclear on something— uh -huh they're not going to hold law enforcement accountable for doing something when there was no precedent prior to this case in Wisconsin saying they mm. couldn't access the Dropbox contents. Mm. Okay. And the state is already kind of being punished here because the evidence obtained from the Dropbox files and anything that came from it can't be used against this deputy sergeant, meaning he's still going to be in the department. I mean, maybe they fired him for other reasons. Uh, right, but right he's not going to be prosecuted for, huh. for breaching the public trust here. So what happens now with this? How, how does Wisconsin makes this decision? How does it spread across the nation potentially? So there's going to be some law review articles about this. Uh, and this is the type of thing that, let's say a case uh, comes up with a similar fact pattern in Oklahoma. Uh, mm. And a judge is going to say to his or her clerks, hey, is there any case law across the country, a situation where... Um, somebody had a Dropbox account uh, with a work email address, and what, what have other courts said? That's going to be persuasive authority. Uh, you know, somebody would have to have a completely different perspective on the issue uh, as a judge in order to come down with a, a different conclusion than this case. But they certainly have the right to, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is only controlling within the court system in, in Wisconsin. I see. Um, but the way the case is argued, at least from my eye, seems like it would be uh, pretty 
persuasive. Huh. Uh, and like I said, it's just not that common that cases like this are going to come up for some of the reasons we talked about. Right. So this really could be the the groundbreaking press, uh, precedent. I mean, we saw that as it related to the content of uh, email communications in the Warshot case, which was a Tenth Circuit case, never made it up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm. Um but it just became the prevailing standard for uh, whether people had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the content of their emails, even though it had emails are stored on third-party servers. Right. Um, that's the other element here is uh, we've talked a lot about the third-party doctrine on this podcast. Um, if you willingly hand information over to a third party, uh, that you lose an expectation of privacy in that information, what the court's saying here is that really doesn't apply here. Uh, because for all intents and purposes, you're not actually handing any information to Dropbox. They do keep a backup version on their servers of everything that's stored there, but they also advertise, and this is all quoted in the case, as saying, your files are safe even from us. Uh, we don't have access to it. Right, right. So you are actually maintaining that expectation of privacy, and I think that's very persuasive to, to judges here. Mm. All right. Well, interesting for sure. Uh, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, my story this week comes from the folks over at the IEEE Spectrum. Uh, IEEE is an uh, electrical engineering organization, uh, very well-known, well-respected. And uh, their article here is titled, Ownership of AI-Generated Code Hotly Disputed, A Copyright Storm May Be Brewing for GitHub Copilot, article written by Rena Diane Caballar. Uh, ben, you and I have touched on this before, and uh, this saga sort of continues here. Um, there is a class action lawsuit uh, being filed against GitHub Copilot, uh, Microsoft, who is their uh, parent company, um, and OpenAI, and they're claiming that um, basically people are pirating open source software and, and violating the open source licenses. Now, um, can, can we jump in here with just a, a little descriptor of when we're talking about open source software, what exactly we mean? So there are rules governing open source software. I mean, there are licensing rules. Right. Uh, generally, open source, of course, is acceptable and preferred in some circumstances as long as it's not using... It's not as, as long as it's not made up of information that is otherwise protected under our intellectual property laws. Mm. Um, so you can't just, for the purpose of creating open source, cobble together a bunch of copyright information and then uh, feed that into either an algorithm or, or anything else and spit it out as open so source software. Mm. Um, so I think that's what we talk about when we talk about violating the licensing regime related to uh, to open source software. So uh, the, this, this co-pilot functionality within GitHub, uh, they have terms and conditions there uh, where, uh, I guess in a, in a classic EULA way, they're saying it's up to the users to keep an eye on this. Uh, obviously, the people who are, who are uh, bringing this class action suit don't agree with that. Um, they point to a, a case, uh, they're saying it's Google versus Oracle, and they say in that case, uh, taking the names of methods but not the functional implementation is okay. You're replacing the functional content but still keeping some of the template. They, are, they have a quote here from Kit Walsh, who's a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and they're arguing that training Copilot on public repositories or repositories is fair use. He says, fair use protects analytical uses of copyrighted work. Copilot is ingesting code and creating associations in its own neural net about what tends to follow and appear in what contexts, and that factual analysis of the underlying works is the kind of fair use that cases involving video game consoles, search engines, and APIs have supported. That's why I kind of struggle with this. I mean, I think Kit Walsh, the senior staff attorney at EFF, makes a reasonable argument that this is fair use. I mean, fair use generally boils down to anything that's not going to lead to somebody making a profit off somebody else's work. Mm -hmm. um, so fair use it would be reproducing academic materials for learning purposes. Mm -hmm. um, 
it really boils down to factors that are almost a little metaphysical here and are going to be really hard to judge. Right. Uh, so what Walsh says is it boils down to, quote, how much Copilot is reproducing from any given element of the training data uh, and if it encompasses creative expression that is copyrightable. That's just so hard to trace. I mean, Copilot says it it ha- you know uses the advanced... Uh, practices in traceability. Mm -hmm. Um, But how can you find that, like, discrete line of code that violates copyright in thousands, millions of lines of code that go into this open source software? Right. It just seems like that would be really difficult to uncover. Um, But it's also not, like, the textbook definition of fair use uh, because somebody is going to profit off uh, what's created through Copilot. I Mm. mean... That's what just. Uh, that's the reason this is a really difficult issue. I'm kind of curious to see uh, what happens in court here because I don't think there is a clear side uh, one way or the other. The thing that I I struggle with, and 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 where I think folks are tiptoeing around one of the core issues is, and as you say, it's sort of metaphysical. Which is, is a computer capable of being creative? And I think a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that. Perhaps under the hood, these neural networks are being creative. And what I mean is, if I'm an artist and I go to my local museum, I go down to Washington, D.C. and spend an afternoon at the National Gallery, and I decide that I'm going to look at all of the Picassos. Right. And then I go home and I create a piece of art that is obviously heavily influenced in the style of Picasso, is that plagiarism. I'm, I'm, I'm being inspired by a great artist, and I'm using that, that person's art to uh, inspire my own work. But my own work is original. Yeah, I mean, that's where this gets really difficult. I think, you know, as far as I know, you are not a computer. Um, <laughs> so there, yeah, I know. Uh, or it just hasn't been revealed yet. That's right. Uh, <laughs> That's a really difficult question. I mean, you are using your own intellectual capabilities in that example to Mm -hmm. extrapolate from your inspiration and create something that's your own. Right. That's not really happening in the context of uh, GitHub here or or Copilot. Isn't it? Well, <laughs> that see that's what it, uh, I mean, I just And when think, is it? If if, it, if we're saying it's not, when is it? Right? Yeah, I mean I, that's really the million dollar question here yeah. is the output of what's being put into this algorithm. Is that the type of creative inspiration that's equivalent to, of you drawing your own Picasso or is it just regurgitating copyrighted information that's already gone in? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like you, I feel like you have to answer that question somewhat philosophically uh, and like, I don't, I just don't know how that's going to work in the judicial well, Context. Let's let's be even more specific about this, because what if I were an artist of collage, right? Okay. So my original art is made up of going through magazines, books, artworks, and cutting out existing bits of art and assembling them in my own way, right? So if I do a bit of collage and I use someone else's artwork in there? Because I I think that's probably more along the lines of what we're talking about I think you would have copyright problems in that context. You think? Yeah. um, It's kind of like what uh, rappers uh, sampling, you know, music and stuff like that, right? Right. We've, we've, yeah. I mean, because then you'd be passing off somebody else's copyrighted material uh, as your own. And, you know, if this was your... uh, fourth grade school project and you're making a collage, who cares, right? Yeah. Uh, But if this is, you know, you want to produce this collage and sell this as a piece of art, then I think you do owe uh, acknowledgements, monetary consideration, et cetera, to the people who actually created those images. Mm. I think the purpose of our intellectual property law is to foster uh, an environment of creativity where people can reap the fruits of their own creative work. Right. Uh, And if you're looking at the spirit of that, it just seems like somebody has actually created the code here. That was the intellectual work. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not, 
is the computer engaging in its own intellectual work in spitting that out and turning it into something else? To me, it just doesn't seem like it does, but hmm. I'm I'm open to being persuaded on this issue. Mm-hmm. This would be a good time to write into our show, actually, <laughs> uh, if you think we're way off base here. Well, but, you know, but I think this is interesting because people are really passionate about this. They are taking sides, and there is spirited discussion, and I think good faith, interesting arguments from both sides. And so, as I say, what what I'm sensing is that there's something about this that I think at our core makes some people uncomfortable. The notion that a computer, that an AI system could express genuine creativity, I think puts a lot of people on edge. And I get it. Yeah. I, I, it doesn't, I, for whatever reason, it doesn't bother me the way that it bothers a lot of other people. But I certainly understand their concerns. Yeah, I mean, we talked about about this in the context of chat GPT. It's, there's mm-hmm. a certain level of creativity uh, that AI uses. And, you know, if I said, write a Shakespeare soliloquy uh, about coffee mugs. Like, right, right. It, again, there's that question of, uh, are you appropriating somebody else's creativity and using that to turn a profit? Mm-hmm. And I think... It's really unclear when we're talking about a computer doing it and how traceable it is to the original copyrighted code. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be something that's really hard to identify. It's like you put a million pieces uh, of, uh, you know, wood chip to set up mulch on somebody's yard. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you go about, you know, finding up which was the mulch that stopped uh, the erosion of of your garden. This is a terrible example. <laughs> I'm with you, Ben. I'm with I know. You. Keep going. Keep, uh, come on, land the plane. No, land the plane. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to jump out and uh, activate my parachute. So, I think I've said this before, and I wonder. I think for a lot of folks who are creative people, and I think uh, people who write code, creative people, artists, creative people, and they're seeing these artificial intelligence systems, uh, you know, coming into their lanes. And I can't help thinking this must be how portraiture artists felt when photography came about. Right. That they're looking at this new technology and they're thinking to themselves, who is going to sit to have their portrait painted when you can press a button and snap a photo and there you go. The whole right. family, right? Right. It's that, to me, I think that's an interesting comparison um, of a technological advancement that, and it's not that we don't have portraiture artists anymore. Right. We do, but they're not the primary way to have your image captured anymore. Right. I think that's a pretty apt comparison. Uh, and I don't know the history of the law there, but I'm sure just like this, that kind of took a while to develop, mm-hmm. um, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible dad joke there. <laughs> we'll, and we'll leave it there. <laughs> we'll leave our Before listeners. Before this gets way worse. Yeah, we'll leave, leave our listeners shaking their heads ruefully at, <laughs> at our dad jokes. All right. Well, we will have a link to uh, that article over from uh, the Spectrum uh, newsletter from the IEEE. Uh, We would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to discuss on the show, you can email us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi.
Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Andrew Hollister. He's from a company called Logrhythm. And we were discussing the uh, recent uh, data exposure incident involving the Shanghai National Police. Turns out, uh, as you know, there are a lot of people in China. And so this— Although they are actually losing their place as the most populous country in the world as we speak. Oh, is that— To is India. India. I, I read is, that last uh, night. Yeah. Oh, interesting. All right. All right. Well— uh, still, a huge data breach, certainly one of the largest in history. And uh, my conversation with Andrew Hollister centers on the potential impacts of that and also with China's policy, whether we'll actually know how bad it was. Here's my conversation with Andrew Hollister. Yeah, so I think it um, kind of came to light around the end of June when actually a, a kind of previously unknown individual put up for sale all of this data, kind of staggeringly, 23 terabytes of PII or personally identifiable information from China, potentially belonging to some uh, 1 billion people, as you say. And, and I think one of the remarkable things here is, is really the, the kind of breadth of information that was actually contained in this um, cache of data, you know, everything from, we would typically see, you know, an email address, possibly a password, a name and a, and a, a date of birth or something like this. But in this case, it really had almost everything you could possibly think of, names, addresses, birthplace, phone numbers, and, and even through to things as sensitive as um, criminal records associated both with um, Chinese or all this information, both associated with Chinese nationals and, and even some foreign nationals who might have visited during the past few years. So um, both in, in scale and, and in breadth uh, is quite a remarkable uh, leak. And where do we suppose this data came from? Well, what was the original source? So it appears to have been accessed from an unsecured police database in Shanghai. And, and again, it's believed to have happened. The, the, the details are a little bit cloudy, but it's believed to have happened because um, a dashboard for managing that database was left open to the internet without a password. So it, this this is obviously information that's that's come from you know, essentially a, a government source um, who are collecting that information on behalf of, of the government uh, organization. Can you help us understand how does this fit in with what we know about the way that China does collect information on their citizens? In a way, kind of Chinese surveillance of their citizens is, is not really a, a kind of speciality of mine, but I, I guess in, in general terms, we know that um, there's a great deal of surveillance that is done within um, China as, as a society. We see that in the media. We, we see that in, in reports. Um, I think the surprising thing here was, was both the, the breadth of that surveillance that this reveals and the, I, I suppose, Revelations, perhaps a, a bit of a strong word, the, the confirmation that that data is at least in some form drawn together, collated and, and made accessible as a complete data set versus that there's, um, you know, kind of discrete stores of data. I, I think the surprising thing was all this data was collected together in one place um, and, and evidently not for the benefit of the, the hacker who is taking the data away, but obviously for the benefit of that organization to be able to get access to a very broad set of data about individuals in, in one source. And how does this inform our own thoughts for how our data is collected? I mean, I, I think about, you know, advertisers, uh, data aggregators, all those sorts of things we talk about all the time here in the West – is it really that different for us than than the types of things we saw from this data breach itself? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a good question, and um, you know, it's it's obviously a concern. It's been a concern of of privacy campaigners and and others for, I guess, a, a, a decade or more now. 
um, and, and the ability to draw different data sets together and, and, and be able to imply certain things of the ability to be able to collect data uh, for one purpose and that that data is perhaps used for many other purposes has been something that's, that's obviously occupied the minds of, um, government and regulators, both in Europe and in the United States. And I think probably notably that the Chinese government have also been occupied with the same issues around, um, the, the, the personal information protection law that was which passed in China, I, I think in in about six or, or eight months before this particular breach. So, but I I think those things are, are very often focused on commercial and rather than public use of data, if you like, it's, it's use by commercial entities versus perhaps use by um, government organisations, and, and certainly that appears to be the case here. When we think about the response of the Chinese government, and by that I mean this has really been tamped down. The the, the very fact that this uh, that this data breach happened has been uh, removed from social media, from from local reporting in China. Uh, that in itself is noteworthy. Yeah, I I, I think it is. Um, I I guess my view would be social media seems to be fairly routinely censored for for both one thing and another in china in general so i i i don't think the fact that this breach was censored in and of itself was probably particularly surprising it would perhaps have been more surprising if it wasn't censored um and and clearly it it um it provides some level of view or or level of insight into the fact that Chinese organizations, be they commercial or be they governmental, wrestle with the same kinds of challenges as Western organizations that were, that were perhaps more commonly used to being seen compromised by these kinds of attacks. They're, they're, they're not immune to it. Um, we're, we're perhaps more used to considering perhaps China and, and other geographies as the source of, of these kind of acts rather than being affected by them themselves. But this, I think this, this pretty well um, illustrates for us uh, where, wherever you are in the world, whatever your kind of, uh, kind of uh, the geopolitical situation, you, you are vulnerable to these kinds of breaches. I wonder, or I can't help wondering if this contributes to what I sense is kind of a growing sense of resignation when it comes to these sorts of things. You know, we hear about data breaches, we hear about our data being vacuumed up by various organizations. And I think for a lot of folks, they feel as though there's not a whole lot they can do about it. And and so, you know, there, there's almost a feeling like, well, it's all out there. So, you know, what, what else is there to do? Yeah, I, I, I know it's, it's a... Um it's 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 a tricky question, isn't it? And you you read some of the reports about the the numbers of billions of records that have been breached over the course of I guess the last ten to twenty years, um, and and there's multiple records per human being on the planet in aggregate. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I I think there is some sense of of resignation that my my data's out there somewhere. Um, on an individual level, um, I, I think on a uh, kind of looking at, I guess, more from a, a commercial or, or organizational level, it, it has been, and, and whether this is resignation or not, I don't know, but it, it has been accepted for some time in the cybersecurity industry, at least, that it's, um, it's when, not if, an, an organization will suffer a, a a breach of some kind or another, um, and and uh, you know I, I think I think this underlines the fact that that irrespective of your geography, that that um, principle stands, and and then really the question is if if that's the case, what can we do about it? Is is it actually we're going to kind of stand back and throw up our hands and and, and kind of despair? Um, 
or, or whether we, we more take the attitude, well, I, I know an attacker's uh, will come after the information that I hold. What, what are the steps that I can take that uh, quickly identify that and, and at least can minimize the impact of that attack? And I, I commented some time ago on a, um, a breach that happened at a, a hotel chain um, and, and a, a, a number of millions, I, I, if I remember correctly, of records were stolen. Um, and the same organization got targeted again uh, about 12 or, or 18 months later. And, and the organization detected and responded to that second breach much more quickly to the extent that many, many fewer records were actually um, breached. And, and I, I think that gives us a, a good illustration. Um, organizations can make progress against these kind of breaches, but it, it takes effort. It takes investment. You know, of course, everybody has a cybersecurity program. Of course, everybody's trying to protect against um, this kind of activity. But the, the actions we take in response to it, um, the actions we take in terms of kind of doing the basics are very, very significant and, and make a difference over time. Ben, what do you think? Really interesting stuff. I mean, a combination of the secretive nature of the Chinese government right. uh, and just the ripple effects that this has had worldwide uh, and the fact that we have uh, so little information, in that sense, makes it uh, kind of terrifying um, and that, you know, we have something that's certainly going to go beyond China's borders, but we know so little about uh, what happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I thought it was a, a really interesting interview. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to Andrew Hollister from Logarithm for taking the time to join us. We do appreciate it. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. <laughs>